Well, good morning, that church. How are you? Man alive. Have you had a good week? Yeah, the Razorbacks didn't lose this week. I feel like that's a success, man. You know, when you're a Razorback fan, you just celebrate the bye week. You're like, okay, we didn't lose. That's good. So anyway, I am super glad you guys are here. Something I want you to make note of is the Lord's Supper that's coming up October the 9th. The details are in your worship guide. Think about that, being here with us. It's a great night of fellowship and worship. Um, it's just an incredible experience. And if you've never been to one, I just want to encourage you to, to come and be a part of it. You know, we are starting a brand new message series today. I mean, I'm talking about right now. It is called Believe It or Not. Now, a few years ago, this will date me, a few years ago, um, there was a, a show on television. It was called Ripley's Believe It or Not. How many of you are old enough to remember that? Okay. And how many of you wouldn't dare admit that you can remember that? But anyway, that's good. So yeah, it was a little while back, but it's a great show. Maybe you've seen the, the, there's a museum of Ripley's Believe It or Not up in Branson, I think it is. And you can go see what, what Ripley's Believe It or Not sort of celebrated was the more strange stories of accomplishments of humanity. You, you get to see a castle built out of matchsticks or something, you know, some kind of, you know, weather phenomenon or something. It was just the more peculiar stories. In that vein, we decided to put together a message series. And we said, you know, there's some stories in the Bible that are complicated, that are hard to believe. They're a little out. Outlandish. And what we said we wanted to do was we're going to confront those stories head on. But we want to approach this with a two prong approach. Not only do we want to deal with those stories that are unique and different, but we also wanted to confront the stories that you need to believe because they're critical to your faith. They're so, so very important. And so that's what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks. In fact, today, I believe we're going to confront what I would say is one of the greatest assertions of the Bible. In fact, it's the most important assertion of the Bible. And for many, it's super hard to believe. It's a story that the Bible tells us about. It's a person the Bible tells us about that's hard for us to acknowledge or even understand. In fact, of all the things in Christianity that's confronted, this one's confronted the most by the world at large. And what is that? It's the issue and the reality of God himself. I mean, that's the most complex presentation that the Bible gives us, is that there is, in fact, a God. So often when we're in church, we sort of assume everybody's on the same page, and we kind of talk about God here, and we don't have much resistance. But when you go into the world, let's be honest, social media has, I think, opened our eyes to this reality. A lot of the world doesn't see the, the things we see, and a lot of the world doesn't see the things the way the Bible presents them. And so I think it's important and healthy for you and I to, to look at these. And so we're going to look at the issue of God. Where, does, where, what is, where should the story take us? What should we believe about God? What do we need to know about God? And so in one message, the best that I can, can in this limited time frame, I want to try to talk about the person of God. And I want you to at least have some things that you could put in your hip pocket and walk out of here with and go, okay, I need to know that. That helped my faith. That strengthened me and that, that brought me along along the way. And so we're going to start with the very first book in the Bible, the very first chapter in the Bible, the very first verse in the Bible, the very first sentence in the Bible. And so you can find that. It's in your outline. You can turn in your Bibles. It's actually there in your Bible too. Um, but Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says this. It says, in the beginning, what's the next word? God. That's right. God. God. The Bible walks into with no apology. The, the, the Bible doesn't care that it confronted someone's sensibilities. It, the Bible acts as if it doesn't matter. The Bible gave us no on-ramp. It didn't prepare us. It didn't say, hey, I want to get you ready because we're about to introduce you to something that's really going to be hard to believe. Complex. No, the Bible just says, in the beginning, God. That's what the Bible says. The Bible lets us know right off the bat that there is something and someone that's greater than you and I. That there's something and someone that all of this he is responsible for. And he is someone that we answer to. And the Bible says, in the beginning, in the beginning, God. And of all the things that you and I must come to grips with, if we're going to have a right relationship and our faith is going to be directed in the right direction, the most fundamental beginning is I have to acknowledge and believe and understand that there is a God. I have to know that. It's huge. In fact, when you come to know God for who he is, many of these other stories that we're going to walk into in later days will be no stretch for you at all. If I can believe that there is a God that created everything out of nothing, then it's not hard for me to believe that, that God could walk on water. If I can believe that God called all things into existence, including us, by the voice of his mouth, then it's not going to be hard for me to believe that God is going to return and receive us to himself. If I can believe that God controls all of human history, then I can also believe that God controls all of human future. 
And so that's what we have to come to grips with is the person of God. When my kids were little, we used to play a game called Jenga. It's either Jenga or Jenga. I don't know which one it is. It's one or the other. Jenga, I think it is. Anybody ever played it? Jenga, anybody? Yeah, like three of us. Okay, awesome. Well, it's this game where you take these like, like rectangular sort of wooden pieces and you stack them up and you sort of make like this little tower and you take turns. One person pulls one out and then the next person has to pull a piece out. And you don't want to be the one that the whole tower falls on. In fact, if you do, you lose. And eventually, as you go around and each person pulls, you know, a non-load-bearing piece out of this Jenga puzzle thing, eventually you get down to the last one. The one that you know for sure. There's no way you could pull it out at all because if you pull it out, you know for sure. And it's the only choice you've got. But when you pull it out, you know the whole thing's going to come crumbling down. God is the Jenga piece for life. He is the most critical understanding, the most important truth you will ever buy into, believe in, trust, and know and understand. Nothing, nothing is in front of the knowledge of the reality of God. Nothing. He is the Jenga piece of all the things that you and I need to know. And Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 6, he says it this way. He says, it's impossible to please God without faith. Now let's define what faith is because oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I, you know, I trust in my faith or my faith is important to me. What do you mean by faith? Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says anyone who wants to come to him, come to God, must believe that God exists. That's where it starts. We have to believe that he exists. He goes on further. He says, and that he rewards those who sincerely seek after him. And that's what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the person of God. We're going to work on exercising our faith. We're going to work on trying to understand and trust and believe in and commit ourselves to a God who has a calling on our life. That's what we're going to look at together. So if you've got your outlines, write this down. First point, number one, we're going to talk about the God that existed before all beginnings. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created. Genesis, the writer of the book of Genesis, lets us know that God predates the beginning of creation. See, God wasn't part of creation. He wasn't post-creation. God is the creator. He created. He's the first mover. He's the one who made this happen. And before anything was ever created, God exists. And here's what the Bible asserts about God. Take this down. Think about it. Number one, he's self-existent. God was not created. He was not concocted. He was not manufactured. God existed before any beginning. He always has been and he always will be. There's a word we use for it. It's eternal. God has no start or no ending. He has always been. He is without without end. He's without beginning. He is God. That's what the Bible asserts about God. And so one of the elements of our faith as Christians is that we believe that God has always been. And so you'll hear people say, well, you know what? You have your faith, but we have our facts. You ever heard that? That's what science will assert. And I would say this, is that science is one of the most confusing magic shows with smoke and mirrors that you'll ever participate in. Much of science, not all of it, but much of science is that way. Because the truth is, is that what science will tell you, science will tell you about a fossil record. Science will tell you about carbon dating. Science will tell you that the the billions and billions of years that went into all this, and science will talk about all kinds of things, how the evolution of animals, it'll talk about oscillating universes and expanding universes and all kinds of other things, which by the way, these theories continue to change. Because as they become testable, that every single major tenet of the original theory of evolution has been shot down. Every major tenet. But they just replace it with something else you can't test. But every time it becomes testable, we shoot them down. But here's what I'll say. Let's, let's go outside the fossil record. Let's go beyond all that. Let's go back before all of that. Let's go back before there was any kind of animal or any element that could make up an animal. Let's go all the way back. And let's ask this one simple question. Where did the universe come from? It's a question I ask atheists all the time. Where did the universe, just answer me that, where did the universe come from? And do you know what is held by most major scientists? Here's what they hold, is that the universe is eternal. It's just always been here. Now, when I was in sixth grade science class, they taught me something. You know what they taught me? It's called the scientific method. You ever heard of it? Yeah, it's the very principle that all science is based upon. You know what the scientific method is? The scientific method consists of a few components. First of all is that you form what's known as a hypothesis. It's just an idea. It could be a strange and foolish idea. It doesn't matter, but you form an idea, something that you believe is true. And then that idea comes under the scrutiny of testing. It's tested. 
and it's tested. And you know what? If it passed the first test, it got through that. It passed the second test. It has to be observable test, by the way. You have to be able to see it. And then it has to be repeatable. That's what I was taught in sixth grade. Were you all taught that in sixth grade? Is that it has to be tested and it has to be repeatable. And once it's been tested and that test has been repeated over a number of times, eventually it becomes a theory. That means it has enough weight and enough evidence to say this is, this is getting close to being true. We, we've got enough evidence that says, hey, this is a theory. It's, it's not just a guess, but it's a theory. Then eventually, after even more time and more tests and more work and more energy is put into it, eventually it becomes what we call a fact. Now, I'm going to ask this question. How can an eternal universe as a hypothesis be tested? How do we test that? How do we test something that doesn't have a date of its beginning or origin? How do we test that? How do we repeat that test? You can't. You want to know why? Because it's not testable. The element that has to be present for you to believe that the universe is eternal is the element of faith. That's why it's so funny when science comes off with such arrogance as it presents itself to us as if we have facts and you guys have a fairy tale and this crazy idea about God is so far-fetched and that's strange. Yet the universe, scientists believe, is eternal. Now consider this for a second, all right? If the universe is eternal, how did we get here? What science will say is, is over a long, long period of time, billions and billions and billions of years, all of the right elements found their way together. And those elements, by the way, have always existed. They were eternal. They found their ways together and, and they came together and they made something intelligent, something creative, something with systems and responses, something with, with a, a cognizant understanding and intelligence. That's what they'll tell you. Now, here's what I'll say. I feel like I have a lot of faith, okay? But it's a stretch for me to believe that something that has no intelligence, that has no ability to have to test its origins, somehow brought parts together that we don't even know what they were, and somehow they came together over a period of time and made something that is so intricate with detail as living organisms is a stretch for my faith. I don't know about your faith. That's a stretch for me. And so one of the things that you're going to learn is that your enemy is really good at deception. And so what he wants you to do is he wants to confound you with some kind of strange ideas and make you believe that what you believe and hold true is really a stretch. But the truth is, it's a much greater stretch to believe that everything came from nothing and there was no intelligent design behind it. There was nothing of any wisdom or intellect that made what has all been that has been made. That's what science wants you to believe and wants me to believe. See, the truth is the Bible presents something very different. The Bible presents that there is an eternal creator. We don't, we don't skirt that issue. In Christianity, we don't skirt the issue that we can't prove it or fully understand it, that God is way beyond our understanding. But we can look around and go, look at the detail and all that's been made. Is it possible that all of this is some cosmic accident? I want you to look at your own hand for just a second. Think about this hand, okay? Think about all the moving parts of this hand and all that it can do. Is it possible that something without wisdom, understanding, knowledge, or intellect provided a hand for you? Is that possible? I mean, years ago when I was in science, which was a really long time ago, and I'm not going to talk about it. I was in school. It's a long time ago. Um, when I was taking science class, we used to use this term. You know what we'd use? We'd call the simple single cell. You remember hearing that? Simple single cell. You know we don't say simple single cell anymore. You want to know why? Because now magnification is at a place that that simple single cell, we've opened it up and we've looked inside of it. And you know what we found? There's more chemical reactions in that simple single cell than happens in New York City in a year, in one second. It's crazy, Right? What we've learned is, is that things are way more complex than we thought. And the more complex they become, the more far-fetched it is to believe that they happened on their own, by themselves, with nothing pushing them. Aristotle said that there's no way for something to happen without first there being a first mover, which Aristotle, by the way, was an atheist, right? Learned that. The Bible says, though, there's a very different story. That God is the creator of all things. He is self-existent. He is eternal. And if you look around and if you just give yourself a moment to look at the evidence and absorb the evidence and consider the evidence, think about how much detail is in this creation. Think about how much detail is in your eye or in your body or in the other complexities of the systems that run your body. When you look at those things, it is impossible or at least preposterous to me to believe that those things could have come about 
with no help, no wisdom, no knowledge. It's impossible. I don't think it's far-fetched for us to trust that there is a God who's always existed. You can see his handiwork. We can see the proof in all of creation over and over. We can look and we can see the proof. So as we look in this and as we consider more about it, one of the things that I want us to consider is this, is that God is eternal. That's a big deal. It means he's always existed. In other words, God's never had a birthday. Never had birthday cake. Isn't that sad? No birthday cake? Man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to be eternal if I didn't get no birthday cake. And no birthday cake. And I know some of you overachievers are going, hey, what about Jesus? We're going to get to that. That's pretty good. You got a Jesus bumper sticker. I like it. We are going to talk about Jesus because the reality is, is that Jesus is God. That's what we believe. That's what the Bible presents. Not only is there an eternal God who made all things, created all things. He's self-existent, always been, always will be. But also that God, he, in, he came incarnate or he, he took on flesh. He became one of us. That very first Christmas, you know what happened? God became a person. That's that manger scene. You remember that? The wise men, the baby in the food trough, Mary and Joseph all hanging out, right? That's the story. God became a person. But here's the question. If Jesus is God, was the manger his beginning? I think it's a question we need to answer, right? Because we believe that Jesus was fully man. We believe that. That's what the Bible presents. But at the same time, the Bible also presents that he's fully God. And so let's see if we can answer that and look at that. John's gospel does answer it, by the way. John is the oldest writer of any of the Gospels. He writes this way late in life. He's an older guy. He's got gray hair at this point when he writes his Gospel. It's sometime after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he writes his Gospel. And, and when John enters his Gospel, he enters it with some very beautiful words. John chapter 1, verse 1. John uses the same parallel words that we found in Genesis chapter 1. Remember Genesis chapter 1 said, in the beginning what? God. That's right. In John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning, the Word. The, the listener would have picked up on that. They would have picked up on the fact that John is paralleling something. He's about to make a point that's going to be very significant. The, the phrase, the word, is a reference to Jesus, and I'll, I'll prove that to you in just a minute. But he says this way, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the word, now listen to this, already existed. In the beginning, the word was already here. God was already here. And you might ask the question, see, when's the beginning? What beginning is John talking about? Well, let me pause that for a second. Let's go to Genesis. In the beginning, God. What beginning is God talking about in Genesis 1? It's the beginning of creation. But in John's gospel, he's not talking about the beginning of creation. He's talking about any beginning. In other words, in the beginning, God already existed. Okay, what beginning are we talking about? The beginning of the pyramids? If you go back to when the pyramids, when they were just digging the foundations for the pyramid, and they just were laying the block, God was already there. Maybe the beginning of the existence of gravity. If you go back to when gravity first came into existence, God's going to already be there. If you want to go back as far as your mind can go, exhaust every calendar that we possibly have, and then add another couple of few billion years to it, God is already there and he's unchanged by it. God does not grow old, nor does he grow young. God is who that he is. He is eternal and he's always been. That's the God that is presented in the word of God. And I'm going to give it to you in a minute why that's really important. And why you need to put that in your hip pocket and know it. Because it's going to give you some power to go through this life that you live in. God is, he is eternal. And John says it this way in John 1.1. He says, in the beginning the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. You go down to verses 13 and 14 of that same chapter. The Bible says, and the word became flesh. And we beheld him. We saw him. He's the only begotten son of the father. He's the God's one and only son. That's what John said. What John has just said was that Jesus, when he was born in the manger, was not the beginning of Jesus. It was the beginning of his earthly ministry. It was the beginning of the salvation of our soul. It was the beginning of where God would answer the ugliest, worst part of me. It's the beginning of where God would take on my sin and my wretchedness and my mess and my filth and my selfishness. And he would ultimately, on his 33rd birthday, carry it to the bald side of a hill where he would be crucified and he would die there so that I might live in freedom and you might live in freedom. Those of us who would trust him. It was not the beginning of Jesus. It was the beginning of the work of redemption when Jesus was born. God is eternal. And you say, okay, okay, so I've got some good ammunition for my scientist friends and my atheist buddies. But how does this help me live? Okay, so let's talk about it a second. The writer of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33 and verse 27, listen to what he says. He says, the eternal God is your refuge. That word refuge is a unique word. It means a place of peace. He is our protection. 
He is our sanctuary. He is our help. He is our strength. He is what we need. That's what he's just said. If you go and read a little further, he says, and his everlasting arms are under you. In other words, God, this eternal God, the reason why us knowing that God has always existed is important is because he's always going to be there for us. That's what the Bible has just said. And so you say, well, how does that help me? It means this, and here's how it helps you. Maybe you're facing some big problems. Maybe your problems are Mount Everest of your life, and and you're in the shadow of some of the worst days you've ever lived in. Listen to me for a second. A God that's always existed is your resource and help and strength. A second thing that I want you to think about how the eternal God helps us is maybe you've heard the farmer's insurance commercial. You know, we know a few things because we've seen a few things. You heard that commercial? Well, let me just tell you something about God. He knows everything because he's seen everything. And so there are times where you have problems and issues that you think are really unique to you. There's times I go through it and I go, oh my gosh, this is, I'm, am I the only one that's got to go through this? I'm a, I, why are my relationships always like this? Maybe that's something you're saying. Or, oh my gosh, that seems like I'm just, how can this keep happening to me? Let me can I tell you something about an eternal God? You're never going to bring him a problem in your life where God goes, whoa, never seen that. Why? Because he's eternal. And you can come to him and God's going to say, I, I got it and I understand it. Incidentally, every time we come to God, God not only does he provide the resource of help for us, God is a resource of help. See, God, God didn't just provide you a prize to take care of your problem. He gives you himself. Your greatest possession in your life is Jesus himself. Not what Jesus can give you, not the big house you desire, not the car with the cool 20-inch wheels, not that whatever it is that you're pursuing, whether it's success or relationship, listen to me, your greatest resource of help, the greatest completion of your life is knowing that Christ is sufficient and he's more than enough and he's all that we need. That is the promise of God. And an eternal God, what's beautiful about that is we can know is that he never goes away. I mean, what, what if you were to pray to God one day and you go, hey, God, I need some help. And God says, hey, I, I'd like to, but I've retired. Be honest with you, people just wore me out. And uh, I'm going to go to the God Retirement Center and you're going to have to find somebody else to help you out. Wouldn't that stink? Wouldn't that stink that the timeline ran out and God's like, that's it? No, I've done all I was good. I'm, you know, I'm 67 billion years old. I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm unplugging, y'all. You people are a bunch of trouble. So I'm going to relax a little bit and... And hang out here at Golden Pond. But, but God doesn't do that. You want to know why? Because he's eternal. And he never goes away. He's always our help and resource and strength. Let me give you a second thing. Write this down if you're writing stuff down. You ought to be writing something down. You're going to need this at some point in your life. You're going to need these, you're going to need these truths. Life is treacherous, y'all. Number two, God created us. It's a big deal. He created us. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created us. It doesn't say that right there in Scripture, so don't anybody get mad because you think I'm being heretical. But if you read on through chapter 2, you're going to find that God created us too. Okay? And I just want you to hang on to this thing that God created us, and that's pretty important. If I were to ask you right now, if you could make anything you want, think about it in your mind. If you could make anything you want, what would you make? Just think, don't say it out loud. Just think about it. What would you make? Some of you right now, you'd be like, I'd make a machine to print money because some of you are criminal like that. You need to repent of that. You know what I'm saying? Um... Others of you'd be like, I'd be making plans for a trip. But for people like me, you say, Scott, if you could make anything, I think of food, okay? So I think of food, all right? When, if you said, Scott, if you could make anything you want, what would you make? You know what I'd make? My mom used to make this French toast like uh, toast stuff. It's not really French toast because you put syrup on French. You didn't put syrup on this. If you did, you'd have to have an insulin shot. It would put you over the, the top, man. Too much sugar. But she would take. Take it, she'd put like milk, whole milk, like real milk, not like the 2%, not that stuff you can see through. I'm talking about fresh from the udder kind of stuff. And she'd put that in a bowl and she'd put sugar in it and nutmeg and she'd put some vanilla in it and, and eggs and she'd mix all that together. And then she'd take white bread. I'm talking full on kill you clogging artery white bread. It didn't have none of those little chips of stuff in it. Wasn't brown. No, that's not bread. White. Got nothing in it that's good for you. And you'd put it in that and she'd just soak that white bread till it was just like mushy. And then she'd have a skillet with real butter in it, and it would be hot. And she'd just put that over in that skillet. She'd brown it on one side, and it'd be real crunchy, and she'd put it on the other side. Oh, y'all. <laughs> Heaven. I'm telling you. I mean, you, you could feel your arteries hardening, and you didn't care. You know what I'm saying? You're like, bring it. I don't care. It's worth it. See, Scott, what would you, if you could make anything, what would you make? That's what I'd make. 
You want to know why I would make that? Because that's what I want. All right? I, that's what I want. Doesn't it make sense? Reasonable, isn't it? Now, let's rewind the tape. Think about this for a second. So God, at some point in eternity's past, God had the opportunity. Remember, he has all the power, he has all the strength, he has all the wisdom, all the knowledge, and he can do anything that he wants to do because he's God. Right? He answers to nobody but himself. And God chose to create. When, when God answers the question, what do you want? And he answered it by what he made. I want you to think about what God made. He made environments for us to live in. He made a universe for us to look at and admire his beauty. He made a circumstance where we might know him. But ultimately, you know what God made when he had a chance to make anything he wanted? He made us. Think about that for a second. Just, just let that just soak in. Just, just do common sense for a minute. When God had a chance to make anything he wanted, he made us. We are God's French toast bread pudding deal. That's what we are to God. He made us. You know what God could have done? He could have made Superman with a cape. God could have made perfect people that don't mess up like you do. God could have made the X-Men, Magneto. He could have, done, he could have made anything he wanted to. X-ray vision, all that stuff. Could have had all the superpowers. God could have made anything he wanted to. And when God chose to make something, he chose to make us. You want to know why? Because he wants you. He could have made something else if he wanted something else. Couldn't he? But he didn't. He made you. Because he wants you. And you know why that's far-fetched for you? Because sometimes you look in the mirror and you see the scars in your history and the past and the hurt and the pain and where you've come up short and your feelings of inadequacy and your blown up, messed up identity and self-image problems and all that other stuff. You see that and you sometimes don't even like you. But I want to assure you something about the God of the universe. He likes you. In fact, he likes you more than likes you. He loves you and he wants you. That's, that's what he feels. He could have made anything, but he didn't. He made you and he made me. Why? Because he wants us. You need to keep that in mind. I want you to know that sometimes you insult God when you sell yourself cheap to people and things that you should never be sold to. God looks at you, and I'm sure it grieves him from time to time when he looks at your life and he looks at your thought process and he looks at how you evaluate yourself and how you value yourself. God looks at you and goes, why would you sell out the most precious possession that I have? Why would you sell it so cheap? God created us. Keep that in mind. That's something about God you need to know. Let me give you a third thing. God is powerful. He is. He's, he's powerful. The first sentence of the first verse of the first chapter of the first book in the Bible. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in one simple sentence, and it just sort of just spit out there as if it's no real big deal. God created the most fundamental elements for life in one moment. <laughs> created all things. Scared you, didn't it? Good. Now we're awake. He created everything. You know what he created? Time, space, and matter. In one movement, God created everything. The Bible says, in the beginning. Did you know that before the beginning, there was no beginning and there was no time? Did you know that? Did you know that God needs no wristwatch? He doesn't need to have a calendar. He doesn't have to have a to-do planner. You want to know why? Because he's eternal. He has no date to get to, no date to get away from. He's not waiting on something to happen. He's not looking forward to anything. He already has all things within his capacity. He knows everything now. That's God. But at the moment of creation, because God knew we would walk into this and we would have to have an understanding and a reality of time, God created time. In the beginning, God created, the, created time. In the beginning, God created uh, the, the heavens and the earth. The heavens, God created space. And he created the earth, God created matter. God created time, space, and matter in one movement of creation. It's encapsulated in one sentence, but I want you to think about how powerful that is. God created all three of these things, how important they are and how significant they are. He created these three things. And so God, God made these things. In the beginning, he created the heavens and the earth. Now I want you to think about something for just a second. Has there ever been a time that, that you've looked to God and you've begun to speak to him and you say, God, I just got nothing left? You ever been there? Been so exhausted, run down? Maybe, maybe it was a complication in a relationship or maybe, maybe your job came to a close or maybe it's something else. And you go, God, I just got nothing left. I've been fighting for this. I've been trying to work on these adult kids of mine that are morons and they're just not responding. Or I'm trying to do this. Or I'm trying to, trying to get ahead, God, and I can't get Every time I try to get ahead, it just feels like I'm two steps backwards. I just got nothing left. You ever said that? We all have. We all get to that place. Well, can I tell you something? That's a great thing. Because when you have nothing left, understand that you serve a God that works great when there's nothing there. God made everything out of nothing. He didn't need a starter. He didn't need a, a base material. 
He himself was more than enough and he called it into existence and it was. That's the power of God. Let me say this to you. Maybe you said this before. I've lost everything. Man, I got nothing. Maybe you lost that job. Maybe the, the people that repossessed things came and got their stuff. Or, or maybe someone walked out of your life. Or, or maybe your house burnt down. I don't know. Maybe your health went away. You thought, man, I've got this. Everything's going good. But then your health went away. You said, I've lost everything, God. You're in a very good spot. You want to know why? Because God's creativity works better when your junk's not in the way. Put it in his hands. Maybe you said something like this. My mom used to say this all the time. She said, I don't have a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out. I'd give you something spiritual about that, but I will say this. If you say that, just don't say that anymore because that's terrible. If you're peeing in a vessel, throwing it out a window, don't do that anymore. That's terrible. <laughs> what if somebody was walking by? You ruined their whole day. That's awful. No, just don't do that. Number four, God knew. Write this down. God knew. God knew. Before you failed, God knew. Before you were afraid, God knew. Before you broke God's heart, God knew. Before that thought turned into an action and that action turned into a mess, God knew. He knew. He knew what you would be. In fact, God knows things about you that you don't know yet. He knows something that you haven't even done yet. He already knows it already now in advance. God knows it now. He knows it. Now listen to me. Yet he created you anyway. What? He created you anyway. He knows full well. He knew all these things. You're going to see this in this creation process. God knew in advance. I'm going to go deep theological for just a second. In Genesis chapter 1, where that verse says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The name God that's right there is the name Elohim. Elohim, it means powerful, almighty God. When God created time, space, and matter, he created it out of his power. Elohim created time, space, and matter. Incidentally, when God created those things, they were created complete and finished. Think about this for a second. No one's improved on time yet, have they? You ever had somebody come to you and say, hey, man, I've got a new improved time for us. We're going to start using this one instead. No, time hasn't been improved upon. Space, has it been improved upon? No. Matter, has it been improved upon? No. They're finished and they're complete. So when God in Genesis chapter 1 is creating time, space, and matter, he creates that out of his power. He creates that complete and finished. But Genesis chapter 2, where God is about to walk us through the creation of mankind, something changes. In fact, in your outline, look at this. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. Because you and I operate in a limited language, and we don't have the extent of the original language, we don't know it, we miss out on some things that the Bible wants us to know. When God created time, space, and matter, he created it out of his power and might. Elohim created it. But when God creates us. When he creates you and I, the name that's used for God, it should be the word Lord. It should be in all caps. The word Lord should be in all caps. That is the word Yahweh. That is the personal, intimate, specific, singular name of God. Now, here's what's important about that name is that name is used exclusively when God is in ref, when, he's ref, when he's referencing himself in relationship with us. OK, when God created the heavens and the earth, he creates it out of the power, mighty Elohim creates it out of the power of God. But when God creates us, he creates us and he changes his name so that he might you might know that he shifted gears. When he created the heavens and the earth, power and might, almighty God, ruler who reigns over all things. But when he created you and I, his name changes. And it's not a subtle change. He changes from creator and author and power to savior to former. In God's creation story, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, God never touches anything. When he creates the universe, the Bible doesn't say, you'll say, God threw the stars. No, he didn't. The Bible says he called for them to be and they were. God never touched the light. When he made the light, he didn't, it didn't happen that way. When God created the heavens, God just called it into existence and it happened. For the first time in all of creative history, God records that when he makes us, he makes us differently. See, when he creates all these other things, he calls them into existence. His power makes it happen. But when he creates you and I, you know what he does? The Bible says that he takes the dust of the ground. And I want you to think of the intimacy of a God who is making something that really means something to him. He's a craftsman. And the Bible says from the dust of the ground, he formed us. And then he breathed in our nostrils the breath of life. And we became a living soul. In this story, here's what's big. 
When God formed us, when God made us, what you see in this story is God understood that we would be a project. You know what's interesting? Is that when God creates man, man is not full and complete. He's a project. God knows it. God changes his name the moment he forms us. Why? Because he knows that he's going to have to help with this project. When God formed us from the dust of the ground, you know what God did? He said yes to the cross. He said yes to a bald side of a hill. He said yes to a brutal beating that he would suffer. He said yes to his blood being spilled. He said yes to a tomb that his broken dead body would be placed into. He said yes to all of that. He said yes to the centuries and centuries of disobedience and rebellion and hatred and anger and bitterness and meanness that comes along with humanity. God said yes to all of it. God said, I'm in it because I want them and I love them. I know they're a mess, but they're mine. And I want them. That's what God said in this story. It's a huge truth. It's a huge truth. Here's the issue. God's answered this question. God, are you up for the project that we are? Are you up for the project that we are? God said, absolutely. Not only did I make you, but I'll pay whatever it costs to save you. God's, God's already answered that question. 2,000 years ago on the bald side of a hill where God's son, the best of heaven, died, God answered, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes I, t- to be with you. That's what God said. But you know the question that's yet to be answered? Is are you up for the project? See, what we want is we want God to flip a switch and we can walk in perfection, do whatever we want to do, and everything's great. It doesn't work like that. See, th- this name Yahweh is a name that God uses when he's operating in relationship with us. And here's what God's saying. God's saying, I made all this other stuff by my power, but I'm going to remake you by this relationship. You and I are going to walk through life together, and I'm going to knock off the rough, and we're going to work together, and you're going to have to overcome some stuff. There's some thinking and thoughts that you have that we've got to get rid of. I'm going to do some work in you, and we're going to walk together, and you're going to become more like me each and every day as you trust me. That's what God said. God was up for the project. Are you? Has there been a moment where you said, yes, the Lord God, I I put myself in your hands, Lord, whatever you ask. You have every right to ask me and call me how to live. Because not only did you make me, you saved me. And I belong to you. Huge, huge, huge story. God created all things, but he formed us, put his hands on us. And every day, whether you know it or not, God is waiting just an arm's distance away from your life to say, hey, let me help you with that. Let me show you how to live. Let Let me change your thoughts on that. Let me cause you to see things as they really are, not the way that everybody else is calling you. I want you to see what I want you to see. You need to see it from my perspective. But you can't get that without an intimate, close relationship with him. Christianity isn't about getting out of hell. Christianity is about getting into the arms of God and walking with him and knowing him. That's what it's about. That's the invitation. That's our opportunity. That was, that's what God's asking you to. I'm going to ask if you will for just a moment, if you would just bow your heads for just a second. Nobody looking around. The eternal God that made all things. He existed before any beginning. By the way, God is at every beginning. Are you ready for the beginning of a new life? God's in that. He's there. Are you ready for a new chapter that's committed to him? God's in that. He's there. Are you ready for your world to be transformed and changed? The beginning of that? God's in that. He's there. Today, God is inviting you into a deep, real, rich relationship with himself. He created you. Why? Because he wants you. He's powerful. I know the obstacles you face, but God's greater than those. And ultimately, God knew. The worst of you, he already knows. Nothing new to him. Are you ready for a relationship with him? If you are, why don't you pray with me? It's not about you and me. It's not about you and the church. It's not about you and anything else. It's about you and God. Today you have a chance to talk to him. Put your life in his hands. Take him up on his offer of forgiveness and a future. If you're ready for that, just pray. Just right now, just silently, just speak to God. No one else needs to hear this. You and him. You and him. Just say this. Say, Lord... I want to have a relationship with you. I need you, God. I can't do this myself. God, I need your power and your strength. I need your forgiveness. I need your purpose in my life, God. 
God, I put my life in your hands. I surrender to you. Thank you for giving your life for me and dying for me. Thank you for being willing to live in me and to show me the truth. God, thank you for saving me. In the days to come, Lord, teach me how to live. But today, God, I give myself to you. I trust you alone. I offer this prayer and I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity we have, God, to share in your word and to understand some things about you, God. No doubt this is a believe it or not issue, Lord, to know you, the eternal, all-powerful God, and to know that we can know you on a personal level and that you care about us that much is incredible. Father, I pray that no one might leave this room today with questions about their relationship with you, Lord. I pray that they'll confirm today, Lord, their relationship with you. God, I pray we'll continue to pursue this relationship and that it might grow and develop. And Lord, you make us into the image of your son, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. We offer this prayer and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm so powerful message. And if you're willing to follow into that next step with God, then um, it's really simple. All you need to do is check off one of these boxes on your Connect card, okay? So look through that Connect card. There's, um, if you want to be baptized, we have a Baptism Sunday coming up, October 27th, okay? So we want to get you baptized if that's the next step for you. Maybe you just committed your life to Christ and you just don't know where to go from here. Mark it on your Connect card. We will be in contact with you because we want to help you out in that. We want your relationship with Jesus to like go further than, um, than just sitting here in the pew. Okay, so mark it on your Connect card, whatever your next step is. Um, we're going to move into our time of offering right now. Okay, so in this time of offering, you can prepare it. Um, we return the tithe here at that church. Um, and so that means we bring to God the first 10% of our income, okay? Because we believe everything was given to us by God. We just were presented the beautiful case that God has been always from the beginning, okay? And so we give back the first 10% in faith back to Him. And that's how we return the tithe. And there's a few ways that you can give here at that church. They're on the screen or they will be on the screen behind me. But you can give online, you can give on our app, or you can give the good old-fashioned way and grab an envelope in the seat back in front of you and then just put it in the bucket as it's passed. I would ask that as the buckets are passed that y'all don't get up and leave. It just really helps our volunteers as they come by and collect all the buckets. Okay, so would y'all please bow your heads and pray with me over the offering. Father, I thank you so much, um, God, for everything you have done. You, um, Father, you could have done anything, but you decided to create us. And um, God, it's just our, our greatest joy to give back to you at all, um, all of this that you have given us. And so I just pray over our church as we prepare for the offering, as we give. I pray it's all done out of joy. We love you and we need you. And in your son's name I pray, amen. Okay, so we have a few announcements. A lot is happening always at our church. Okay, so a few announcements are we have our church leadership school registration is open. So if God is kind of tugging at your heart that you feel like you need to take that next step um, and become a church leader, um, and, or if you just want to like go deeper into discipleship, go check out our booth. It's in the lobby for the church leadership school. This Wednesday, so Point Man and Rural Women just went on break, but this Wednesday we have Lord's Supper, so in a night of worship. Okay, so if you are a believer, if you come to our church, you need to be here on Wednesday. Taking the Lord's Supper as a community of believers is one of Jesus' firm commands in the scripture. So make sure you're here. All the information you need for that night of worship is on your worship guide, okay? So um, that's for this Wednesday. Then we have Fall Fest coming. Anyone ever been to a Fall Fest here? Yay, okay, we serve the community and they show up and it's so much fun. You see a lot of crazy outfits and costumes and we will hand out a bunch of candy and play a bunch of games. So if you've never volunteered at that church before, then please uh, fill out that Connect card. It's a simple one-time only uh, volunteering thing that you can start to get to know people and serve the community. 
And here at that church, we love this city. And we're doing two really important ways to show our love for this city. And the first way is we are doing Thanksgiving food boxes, okay? So we have talked to a bunch of the schools in the area to find out those kids and families in need. And we've got food boxes that y'all will fill up with food and hand out Thanksgiving food to those families. And then the last thing we're doing, or the next thing we're doing, is our angel tree, uh, angel Christmas tree project, and that'll be super exciting. And in just a, sa- or a few Sundays, y'all will have invites for needy families. Okay, guys, thank y'all so much for staying put. Y'all are great, and have a great rest of your Sunday.